been attending a lot of workshops this uh, this uh, week that um, uh, on on uh, best practices for online uh, uh, teaching and so forth. And uh, one of the things that practically every workshop starts with is is some um, um, <clears throat> uh is is usually some background um on um things that are not that don't seem germane to the topic at first <clears throat> and i'm going to do the same he here so we're going to start by talking a little bit about english and the sounds of english and and why why uh, we have such trouble mispronouncing foreign words compared with speakers of some other languages whose, whose spelling systems are much more transparent than ours there we go. Okay, so um, basically, I'm going to start out with some uh, background on on um, the the nature of speech sounds, um, and um, uh, with uh, English as our reference point, and then go to Latin, and then to Greek, uh, and that'll make it easier for you to understand the quirkiness of of Greek spelling and Greek uh, Greek pronunciation. So we'll start out with uh, uh, a little bit about uh, what I just uh, mentioned, why English spelling is so crazy, uh, why, why uh, you know, our alphabet is not an English alphabet, it's the alphabet that the Romans devised for their language, and uh, how the history of English uh, uh, vowel uh, development over the centuries uh, is, was poorly timed for our spelling system to be easy to learn. So um, uh, if you think about uh, all the words from other languages that we, uh, we borrow and then butcher very often, uh, if you know the source language, there's two main reasons why we, why we do that. One is that the source language may have uh, sounds that we don't have in, um, uh, in the, the first list of words there. So like Tosa, a uh, language of Southern Africa that has clicks. Okay, we don't, so, we have to figure out how to interpret that pronunciation. So South Africans who don't speak it uh, will just say Kosa, or Bach instead of Bach, or Kaida instead of Haida. Uh, I've heard people pronounce Lieber Hape as Lieber Chet, um, and so forth and so on. Um, there's also sometimes cases where we have familiar sounds, but they're in positions or combinations that don't work for English. So Tbilisi is not a, to be is not a possible syllable of English. Or we can't begin words with n, um, or, you know, combinations like in words like gnosis or him, uh, him or xeno or pneumo and so forth. There's also uh, spelling reasons why uh, we often make mistakes in pronouncing other people's uh, words from other languages. And sometimes that's their fault because their spelling may also be just as quirky as ours, but in different ways. So instead of Quebec, we say Quebec, or Volkswagen for Volkswagen, and, uh, and so forth and so on. I, I was intrigued to find out that Fuchsia is really named after somebody named Fuchs, so it really should be Fuchsia. <laughs> Um, sometimes it's our, our fault. So Pisces, we should be able to say Pisces, but we don't, or Jesus instead of Jesus. So our spelling rules just kick in and uh, make us say horrible things like Palos Verdes and Ponce de Leon and uh, so forth and so on. And then sometimes uh, uh, the people uh, who's, who use other alphabets, when they uh, Romanize to the uh, Roman alphabet, uh, have English speakers in mind and try to trick us into pronouncing their words correctly, and then we second guess them. So instead of saying Beijing the way they want us to, we say Beij a lot of people say Beijing because they're trying to sound foreign in French. Uh, or Myanmar, it's really Myanma. Uh, so they're they're pitching this to a British audience who would pronounce who would not pronounce that wrong. Anyway, so that's a little bit of background as to why I'm doing this. Uh, next uh, up is um, a little bit about our alphabet, since we're going to be getting to the Greek alphabet too, and uh, of course that's uh, you know has inter uh, significance for gematria and what we do. Uh, so our uh, alphabet is the Roman or Latin alphabet. And um, while we uh, have about 11 distinct vowels and three more diphthongs, uh, Latin only had five such vowels. 
and um, those vowels came long and short, but they were basically the same, like, the same five basic vowels. So that's why we have only five vowel letters, but we have all these uh, idiosyncrasies as to how we render the, 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 the 14 vowels and diphthongs of English. Um, and um, it actually turns out that we have the same three diphthongs as Latin had, I, uh, owl, and oi, but Latin spelled I in a way that's very transparent, ah, a, I, right? But for us, the, that sound is spelled with a single letter as if it's not a diphthong. Uh, they have a, ah, oo, giving us ow. We spell it with o and oo instead, and so forth and so on. We also have a lot more consonants than Latin did. So we have a ch sound, a sh sound, a j sound, a j sound, that n sound that uh, we use at the ends of words or in the middles of words. Uh, Latin had one sound category corresponding to both v and w, uh, change from w to v over, over the centuries. We need to distinguish those. We have two th sounds. You don't realize it, but we have a th sound in phi and a v sound in vi, or ether versus either, or teeth versus teeth in modern English. So um, these are all, uh, uh, and so for these uh, sounds, we had to either uh, you know, combine letters or other languages will add di diacritic marks to those letters to, to, uh, to have symbols for those sounds. So basically we have to build on the Roman, al the limitations that the Roman alphabet gives us. So that said, let's, uh, it'll be helpful if you can orient yourselves to how the Romans pronounced the five vowel letters and how those were pronounced in Middle English before the great English vowel shift and why our spelling now is, makes us so incompatible with other languages where vowels are concerned. So um, this is a chart. I'm gonna be showing you some phonetic charts. Uh, I'm trying to use simpler language to, to so that you, uh, uh, it's not too much in the way of terminology. One bit of terminology is monophthong and diphthong. Diphthong is two vowels together crammed into the same syllable. So. Uh, it's a compound vowel, and monophthongs are sounds that pre pretty much stay the same from beginning to end. Um, so Latin had the vowel sound e, uh, which came long and short, e and e, uh, a and a, or maybe a and a, we're not sure, somewhere uh, midway between e and a. Ah. Okay, so if you pronounce e, you'll notice that your jaw is quite high, and your tongue is very close to the roof of your mouth. But when you say ah, your tongue position is low. So we call vowels like ah and in English ah, uh, low vowels. Those are the vowels that the doctor tells you to, to say when they want to look down your throat, you know, with the tongue depressor. If a, a trick about that, if you, I, as a kid, my dad, who was a, an amateur linguist, told me, Try pronouncing ah instead of ah when the doctor asks you to do that and you, you, you won't have to gag so much on the tongue depressor because it moves your tongue all the way forward in your mouth and, and widens your throat line. Um, and then in the back series, farther back in the mouth, um, uh, the tongue body is very high in the back of the mouth for the ooh vowel and a little bit lower in a midway position for o. Oh. Okay, so try pronouncing all of these vowels on your own. Uh, pronounce e, e, a, a, and then ah, and see how your tongue, your uh, jaw gets lower as you go down. Yeah, and same for ooh. Okay. Now, one thing that we need to keep in mind for Latin is uh, is that uh, since ooh and w were the same sound, also of uh, 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 and, and sorry, w and v were the same sound. Also, u and w were considered the same sound. So there was only one letter corresponding to our three letters, u, v, and w. Uh, so in inscriptions, you'll often see v, where we would, in modern uh, practice, put a, a, a u letter. Okay, uh, so now, um, in that same framework, I've put the vowels of Middle English, which were spelled in a way that mostly matches uh, Latin conventions. So the word that we now pronounce bide or bright had the vowel e here, and it was a long version of it. So this was bida, 
And this was Brich. Um, and the short version was bid and bit, very much like we pronounce today. Um, the mid, ver mid counterpart to this E was uh, a pair of vowels A and A eh, that I've lumped together just for simplification here. So this was bad, bait, and then these were short bed and bet. And then the low version of that in, uh, in Middle English was a very front version of odd, namely the ah sound that we have in modern English as well, in bat or bad. Um, and uh, here it came again, short and long, bad or bad. Um, in the back series, we had oo, which uh, was spelled O-U or O-W because our uh, spelling got influenced by French after the Norman con conquest, and the French pronounced their their pronunciation of the old Latin U had turned into an U, which we'll be seeing in Greek. <laughs> so um, uh, we uh, uh, use this for the um, uh, historical U. The short version was U, like in bud and put. Okay, so this would have been pronounced in those days. Uh, this would be the verb to bow. I bowed down. That would be bo, uh, booed in Middle English, and this would be boot. And the word that we now pronounce boot was pronounced bold. And uh, if they had the verb to boo, it would be bowed. And uh, the short version of that would be bod and bought. And then they had a lower vowel, bod and bought, that's sort of like a very back and rounded ah. Uh. Uh, and then we had three diphthongs in those days, i, oi, and ow, too. So um, this would have been pronounced bite. This would have been pronounced talked. If, if, uh, if they had computers back then, um, uh, this would be bowed, if anybody remembers what bowed is from the early days of computer of computation. Um, boy, the oi vowel has kind of stayed the same over time. So now what I'm gonna do is sort of animate what happened with the vowel shift, that basically we had a game of musical chairs among the long vowels of the diphthong, but not the short vowels. So our short vowels then agree more with the rest of the world than that uses the Roman alphabet than our long vowels. So here the low vowels started, uh, long low vowels and the diphthongs uh, that began with low vowels started to raise to mid vowels, which then pushed the mid vowels, uh, crowded them together. And in order to not end up with massive homophony or homonymy among words, um, speakers of English started pronouncing those mid-vowel words higher till, till they crowded out the high vowels. The high vowels had nowhere to go, so they, uh, they went back and became diphthongs. So that now, uh, and then a few other little things happened here. Uh, the short back vowels became lower, and uh, in Philadelphia, we have a special thing going on with bad, where it's bad. Uh, uh, a very special Philadelphia thing with mad, bad, glad, uh, and, and you know, if nothing else. And we can actually make a distinction between, um, you know, um, uh, somebody who um, bans books would be a book banner, but a flag that you fly would be a book banner. And so forth. A special quirk of, of uh, Philadelphia English that's uh, a, a pearl. Um, so the problem is with uh, English spelling is that right, ar right around Chaucer's time is when English spelling started to get, get more sol uh, solidified and conventionalized with the uh, advent of the printing press. Um, and uh, so uh, our spelling still reflects a lot of aspects of the Middle English pronunciation, despite the fact that now our historical high vowel, long high vowels are way down here in the diphthong territory. The, the historical low vowels are mostly mid, the historical mid vowels are high, and it's all scrambled all over the place. So that's basically why uh, we have such a challenge and wh why it's often a challenge with regard to the uh, vowels of uh, foreign languages when we're learning to pronounce them. So with that, let's uh, go back to the vowels of, of Latin and use those as a reference point for the vowels of Greek because a lot of the letters look uh, exactly the same or somewhat the same and so can be used as mnemonics for you to, to actually read Greek without a pronunciation key uh, or at least start practicing doing so. So the letter A in Latin uh, comes from, uh, and, and again the Romans got their alphabet uh, from 
the Greek alphabet through the intermediary step of the Etruscan uh, uh, variant of the Greek alphabet. So um, there's a reason for these similarities. So our letter A, which again was pronounced in, Brit in, um, in, um, in, in Latin as long A ah, or short A ah, as in pot in, in, in American pronunciation, um, came from the uh, Greek letter alpha, which looks exactly the same in its capital version, but the lowercase versions tended to come from handwriting conventions that, that were much more idiosyncratic to one culture or another. Um, so you'll see that um, uh, often you can't tell whether an ah is long from the spelling unless it's been annotated with this macron here, this length mark. And then in some words, you're gonna see this uh, iota that is not pronounced um, because it follows a long vowel and it'll be written uh, lowercase underneath here. So you can just ignore those and, um, uh, and, and interpret all these as long ahs. And uh, actually for our purposes, the difference between those is, is not gonna matter a lot. Uh, the next, uh, the mid vowel A or A, eh, okay? So in Latin, the long version was usually A, a little higher tongue position than the short version F eh, and pet. Um, Greek, uh, in Greek, it, it's, it depends on what historical straight stage you're in, which one was, was A and which one was F. Eh. We're gonna go with like a late, late antiquity, late uh, ancient pronunciation on its way to becoming the, the Hellenistic pronunciation where we uh, have A for the long vowel and F eh for the short vowel. But if you get those mixed up, it's no big deal. Um, so here, uh, the Greeks um, uh, used this vowel that we know as letter E, um, uh, called that epsilon, which means simple A, uh, to distinguish it from some of the other vowels that started to get pronounced like that over uh, in many centuries later. Um, and then they had this extra letter from the Phoenician alphabet, uh, chet, <clears throat> that we know as the Hebrew word letter, chet, um, that they didn't have an equivalent for in many modern variety, in many varieties of Greek at the time. But some varieties of Greek did use that for the h huh sound just as we do in our alphabet. So I'll be coming back to that. But the, for, because of dialect variation, um, that came to be used as a vowel letter for this longer a uh, vowel. Uh, so that is something to get used to, uh, seeing that as a vowel letter and interpreting this, uh, you know, it's like our H, but uh, without a, 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 an ascending character. Their equivalent to our letter I is what we call iota. Uh, that would have been pronounced E or iota in those days. Um, <clears throat> our letter O um, um, comes from the uh, small O, Omicron. Okay, Omicron is little O. And omega is mega o, big big o. Okay, so um, here um, they didn't have a letter to ready-made, waiting to be used by uh, from the Phoenician alphabet. So what they did was they just wrote two o's together. And here's actually where I should try and use the the um, annotation function. If you uh, look at this, this looks like a w, but what it really is is two o's mushed together, okay? But partially overlapping. And so here it's the same thing where you have the curly cues at the end that have gotten sort of flattened out and turned into this. Okay. So if that helps you remember that that's the long O or the name Omega uh, associated with mega and, and long, that might be helpful. Uh, next up is the uh, vowel that we know as the letter U. Um, uh, we, um, um, uh, this uh, doesn't have an exact equivalent in, in, uh, in Greek. Uh, what, what Greek had looked similar, but it had this tail on the end. It looks a little more like the original Phoenician vav. Um, and um, that was their original letter, letter U. But uh, by the time of quite early on in the history of Greek, that turned into an U, just like the French uh, did with their U's of Latin, turning them into U's, okay? Um, so uh, this is the best way to approximate that using English uh, phonetic spelling for those of you who, who um, 
are, are need, need that as, a, as an aid. So um, basically, we had short and long U. Um, now, you'll notice there were these diphthongs with uh, iota here. Um, mid to high diphthongs that were uh, short, like a and oi and o um, and um, so forth, they all um, raised to just become like their high, their endpoints. So uh, by the, the time of late antiquity, ei, epsilon, iota is pronounced e just like a long e, long uh, iota. And o plus upsilon, omicron plus upsilon came to be pronounced as u, replacing the, the u that got turned into an u. So basically when the u uh, uh, moved forward, it left a vacuum there in the upper right hand corner of our chart. Right? Uh, where where we can where um, a new vowel uh, evolved from this one, so unfortunately we've got these weird diphthongs to um, to interpret that don't exactly match our our interpretations of the corresponding letters. Although this comes close to the uh, French uh, O U uh, spelling of E. All right, so uh, so with that, um, let's do some vowel practice. I. Uh, <laughs> took some stuff from the mass, the Gnostic mass, and then uh, uh, tried to, to find um, an electronic version of the uh, papyri grecai. There's no good way to, to mispronounce that. Papyri grecai magikai in Latin, or the, uh, the Greek magical papyri, but trying to pronounce that in anglicized Latin is, is, a, is, is a horror thing. So, um, I, why don't, uh, why don't you try these for yourselves? I, I, I could do breakout rooms where you pair off and do that, but um, that might be more complicated than it's, than, it's, uh, than it's worth. So I'll just give you a few moments to try uh, pronouncing these um, on your own. So uh, breakout rooms, we can do that. Nah, okay. All right, just try pronouncing uh, these though on your own. Uh, we of course know this one. This is e, e o, right? Um, here we have e o, e o, or yo, yo, um, depending on how you interpret it. And then here you see in these uh, magical papyri, you see um, starting with uh, these are in the alphabetical order they occur in the alphabet, but they um, they do sort of progress in in kind of a uh, a couple of sequences going from the low vowel ah here down to uh, up to eh, and then up to the higher a in, in later Greek, uh, which this would have been, and then up to e. So try pronouncing that ah, eh, a, e. And then over to um, the back vowels, these are a little more randomly uh, organized phonetically speaking to o, to u, and to u. Okay. Uh, to O, oh, sorry, sorry, back down, back to a long O. So anyway, th that gives you an idea. Um, I will go back to um, presentation mode. And um, uh, move on to uh, s uh, some more technical uh, stuff about the, uh, or nuts and bolts for you um, uh, regarding the, um, um, the arrangement of, um, of, um, or the pronunciation of, of uh, consonants and vowels. Let me just, uh, hold on, let me see something here. I can't see you all. Okay, now I can see you. All right, so we'll start with uh, uh, just situating ourselves in the timeline of Greek. Uh, the earliest form of Greek is what was found on the Linear B tablets, was written in a totally different way than, uh, than, um, than the um, one we're used to. Um, so that gives us insight into how this uh, language evolved from the Proto-Indo-European language that, that's the mother of, of tongue of, of so many of the languages of Europe. Uh, then we get to Ancient Greek, and there's some very archaic forms of Ancient Greek that um, like uh, in Homer's uh, 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 and other other um, poets, epic poetry, and then there's classical Greek, <clears throat> um, which is you know the later period of which uh, is what we're going to be looking at, and we're going to probably be looking at it as a as a form of Greek that was 
used maybe for ritual purposes even uh, into the next period, which is known as the 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 um, Koine or Kuni uh, or Kuni Greek um, variety, otherwise known as Alexandrian Greek. Uh, it's it's basically the Greek of the Hellenistic period, and so that's uh, what what the the Greek that we see in uh, the the uh, Septuagint um, version of the uh, the Hebrew uh, scriptures and the New Testament of Christianity. And then that evolved into medieval or Byzantine Greek and uh, thence to modern Greek. So I'll be happy to do another presentation on modern Greek pronunciation or, or, or some later version. Uh, and then you'll be able to, you'll be, if you have this as your basis, you'll be able to make better sense of, of the modern Greek pronunciation quirks. And then you can pick and choose which features you like and have your own hybrid version of Greek that a lot of people use. Just uh, be careful using it around people like Cassie who will find that uh, uh, hybrid pronunciation of offensive um, to their modern Greek speaking sensibilities. Excuse me. So let's, um, we've looked at the vowels <clears throat> a little bit. Let's uh, now look at Greek consonants. And there's some quirks about the Greek consonants that require us uh, uh, to have a little excursus on the way we use our larynx in speech. And then we'll come back to the vowels and diphthongs in one of those chart forms instead of the alphabetical list. And then we'll get to the um, alphabetical uh, listing of, of Greek letters. <clears throat> so um, um, I've arranged these in, a tr in the way that uh, linguists typically arrange uh, charts of sounds in a, a, as a phonetic chart organized uh, with columns that correspond to how far front or back in the, the, the mouth uh, and throat uh, uh, the uh, sound's um, main point of articulation um, occurs. So we have uh, a whole column of sounds that are made with one or both lips. We have another bunch of sounds that are made with the tip of the tongue or the front of the tongue. And then another bunch of uh, sounds that are made with the body, which is the back of the tongue. And then some different languages have different amounts of, of sounds uh, that are articulated at the larynx or in the throat above the larynx. <clears throat> so we have some sounds in each of those four categories in Greek. Um, the next, uh, the, the rows in these charts um, are based on manner of articulation, how the, 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 um, the contact between the uh, moving parts of the, the, the mouth are, is, uh, is happening, how, how severe is the closure. So with the top, um, top group, these involve actual stoppage of the airflow as we speak. So there's a momentary stoppage when we say apa. So everybody say just the sequence, apa. Ah, pa. Now I want you to pause in to in the middle of the the p sound that you're making. Okay, so prolong the p. Ah, pa. And and now try that again. And can you breathe while you're doing that? Ah, pa. You can't breathe until you release it. So the actual sound itself is total silence. Is total is is in, But once we release it. Um, we hear this little explosion. So these are often called either stops or plosives. Uh, I thought plosive uh, was maybe a little more uh, descriptive for, for non-technical audience. Um, so these sounds uh, in many languages come in two or three varieties. In English, they come in two varieties. In Greek, they came in three varieties. And um, we'll be talking about aspiration and voicing in the next uh, slide or, or um, so I'll um, just uh, mention here that I've highlighted in red the letters that are unfamiliar or are false friends. So like this letter that looks like the letter X of the Roman alphabet is actually pronounced K in ancient Greek and K in modern Greek. You know, so it represents a different sound. Um, sometimes we have a letter whose lowercase form looks like uh, one that we recognize. That looks like a funny letter D, right? but the capital letter looks very different from RD. Um, so, um, uh, so there are some uh, letters that you can recognize, uh, K and uh, Kappa and Beta being uh, the, the, 
the most uh, co cooperative of those. The worst false friend is the letter rho, which represents the R sound, but looks like our letter P, which um, looks very different in, 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 in their alphabet. That's a problem in Russian too. Uh, there's a very funny story about about a, a, an error like that that a, a, a friend of mine who's a Russian teacher told me to ask me about in the Q and A. Um, so um, uh, the other categories of sounds besides plosives are um, uh, another row of sounds of which Greek had very few, but English has a lot more called spirants or fricatives. These are uh, sounds that are produced with almost stop closure, but allowing a little bit of air to squeeze through. But the opening is so small that the air molecules all collide with one another and make noise. And so it sounds like two macroscopic objects are rubbing against each other, hence the term fricative. But there's also this breathiness to them that, that uh, this term spirant uh, evokes. So we have s here in, in Greek, um, but in English, we have f, v, th, v, sh, j, all those other sounds are also spirants. Um, there is also this H sound, which I mentioned um, was uh, lost in many dialects of Greek. And so the letter eta that we know as the letter H got re, uh, repurposed for a vowel. And so they have a, a, used a, a, a little apostrophe-like diacritic to represent that in later, uh, later times that again, I'll be talking about in the next slide. Uh, next up are clusters, consonants of consonant clusters. Uh, they ha uh, had special letters for clusters of consonants like our letter X in Latin, which represents actually two sounds in a row, tax, okay? Uh, their version of that letter is, uh, looks very different from our, our version. Uh, ps in psychology or whatever, ps, that was pronounced ps. Uh, they, that, got its special letter. And then the uh, letter Zion from, from, from the Phoenician alphabet got um, used for what uh, earlier on was a, a cluster, z or z, and later became simplified to a z. Uh, the next set of sounds are nasals. Those are important for us when we uh, chant om, okay? Because basically we have m and na, and usually the concept of nasal is pretty easy for people to to um, uh, to, um, uh, to intuit, okay, because you can feel your nose vibrating. If you put your finger on your nose while you're saying, mm, you can feel, feel the vibration or you can feel it sort of um, uh, affecting the sound. Um, so we have a, late, uh, a, a nasal that's produced with the lips, m, one with the front or the tip of the tongue, n, and then there's another one produced with the back of the tongue, nga, nga, and sing and so forth. Um, and um, uh, Greek had that sound too. And they, um, unlike in Latin and in English, where they wrote it with the same letter as the front of the tongue end, they used the letter for g. Uh, because if you have a cold and you go to pronounce one of these letters, eb, ed, ed, egg, egg, they're going to turn it into b, d, g, okay? The only difference is whether there's air flowing through the nose when you pronounce them. So they, uh, you're going to see these double gammas or gamma kappa that look like, ugh, how do I pronounce that? The, the first of those gammas is to be pronounced as a ng, okay? Um, but Crowley seems to have sort of played with that in, in using this spelling of the aum uh, syllable. Uh, to get us to go through the whole, all three nasal series. I think his intention here was for the gamma to represent that n sound. Uh, makes a lot more sense than suddenly going to g. So instead of aumgun, right? Uh, it, it's, uh, I, I take that as an instruction to go aum. And then while my lips are closed, I can even keep my lips closed through the rest of that series. Mm -hmm. Um, you can still hear a difference between uh, where the tongue is, even behind closed lips. Mm, it's a very subtle difference, um, but um, that's, um, that's, that's uh, a little bit of bulimic insight there. Uh, we also have a lateral sound, l, which has uh, airflow around the sides of the tongue, and a trill or a tap, r, or r, 
uh, for the R sound. Uh, our, our R sound used to be like that and still is in places like Scotland, where they have the, the Scottish brogue with a, a, a trilled or trap, tap R. Lastly, there was a W sound, um, which is just a, a short version of U, and uh, a Y sound that was a short version of E. So if you think of, of, of the um, um, uh, scene from The Wizard of Oz where uh, the w Wicked Witch's henchmen were marching into her, her castle chanting. What were they chanting? Oh, wee, oh, oh. All right, so let's take the beginning of that. The oh, wee, oh. How many syllables is that? Hold up hands. Three, right. Um, so now, make the middle syllable syncopated. Musically, make it a, a quarter note instead of a, 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 or a half note or whatever, a, an eighth note instead of a quarter note. Oh, we, oh, saw that? Oh, we, oh. And now make the E even shorter. Oh, we, oh. And still shorter. Oh, we, oh, oh, we, oh. And now that E has turned into a Y sound, okay? Um, same with wa. If we were to take a, u, a, and do the same trick, it would be ah, ooh, ah, and then that would just become awa. Okay. So um, the, uh, just like the Romans didn't have a special letter for, uh, for E versus Y, uh, the Greeks also used the same letter iota for both of those. Um, they also have a letter for W that uh, fell out of use because uh, most varieties of Greek lost it very early on. But um, since this was the Greek letter, uh, the Hebrew, developed from the Phoenician and Hebrew letter Vav, uh, which had the number six, it was retained for numerical purposes. So, and, and of course, we also see this evolved into the uh, Roman letter F that we know today. All right, so uh, moving on to um, uh, the uh, excursus on the role of the larynx, okay. So, um, Voicing is the term that linguists use for that buzzing of your larynx that you get when you pronounce a vowel. So everybody just say ah and feel your throat, feel the larynx buzzing there. Ah, okay. <clears throat> now whisper ah. And no, no vibration there. So uh, try that back and forth with different vowels. E, U, okay. And now try the uh, nasals. Mm, you feel that buzzing? L, er, u, ya, all nasal, all um, all voiced. But the uh, the the consonants in the top of the chart, the the plosives and the and the spirants, uh, have uh, tip, very often in many languages come in a voiced and a voiceless uh, variety. So we have um, pairs of voiceless and voiced consonants. So uh, with the 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 lip sound, we have p. B, f, v in English. Uh, t, d, uh, s, z, ch, z, uh, th, and v in English. And then k and g paired with one another. Um, <clears throat> now that's it. When we say a pa, um, there's a little puff of voicelessness that persists into the, into the following vowel. So try saying that again and put your hand in front of your mouth and say a pa. Ah, pa. You feel the puff of breath there. Ah, pa. Um, so say the word pot and feel that puff of breath there. Pot, pot. Now say the word spot. Spot, spot. Not so much. Maybe there's some, some breath with the S, but not for the P. Same with appeal. Appeal versus apple. Okay. So our voiceless stops, pot, top, cop, uh, appeal, retain, record, um, get aspirated when they're at the beginning of the word or in, in a stress, at the beginning of a stress syllable, but they, they get unaspirated in other positions like spot or apple or ret retina or record. record. Um, so that difference is entirely predictable in English. We don't have to have a spe special letter for these three sounds compared with these three sounds. Um, and again, we're using this little superscript H for that puff of breath, because if you put that, just that before a vowel without any, any consonant, you get ha. So 
So say a voice, whisper an ah, and now pronounce an ah, ah, and you've got uh, what we perceive as the, the H sound. So uh, I'm going to be using that symbol, that superscript H, with, uh, and then this sort of equal sign indicating no H uh, to distinguish the aspirated and non-aspirated stops. In Greek, the difference between an aspirated and non-aspirated stop is not predictable from the position and the word that the stop occurs in. It's actually going to make for the difference between two completely different or unrelated words. So epe is, he said, but epe is words. Uh, here's a good one, telema, telema, okay? Uh, begins with an aspirated t, telema. Um, but uh, ends, you know, teleology, that's tele, tele with an unaspirated t. Or kora, sorry, kora, country versus kore, girl. Uh, so this is a difficult thing for us to, to keep uh, uh, straight in our minds because it's natural for us to pronounce both of these with aspiration and it would probably be natural for us not to aspirate either of these. So, so it's, it's, it's tricky. Um, they had the same thing with H. They had an H sound that came just before vowels without any consonant before it. Um, but because there, a lot of dialects lost it, the way they conceived of it got really all complicated and they called it the rough breathing. And um, uh, again, there's a difference between uh, horos and oros, okay? So words, uh, and that was conceived of as a, just a difference on the vowel itself, in the quality of the vowel. And for some weird reason, all upsilons uh, that begin a, a word uh, are, are, um, are, have rough breathing, are, are pre-aspirated, and all r's at the beginnings of words are pre-aspirated. So, uh, so let's try pronouncing these, okay? I didn't give you a pronunciation for keys for these. So how do we pronounce upsilon, which is actually in Greek was hoopsilon, but so that would be who, this would be, you know, that is the letter pi, right? Omicron. So we have hoopo, which is hypo, hypodermic, hypo. Um, and then who, this is epsilon, that would be a. Eh. And then remember, this is a false friend, this is our, this is their R, so this is super, uh, super, sub and super, hypo and hyper. How about this one? Let's try this one. And again, when it was uh, when we borrow words from Greek, we always write that those initial R's with an H to capture this rough breathing. So this would be R H R, 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 R no. Rino, ke, that's an R again. That's a long O, and this is our final S. So rhinoceros, rhinoceros, okay. uh, nose horn, or pru. All right, so we've got pru, uh, uh, aspirated t. We wouldn't pronounce a T that way in that position. Rhythmos. Rhythm and uh, pra, that's a psi, psi, raps, o, dia, raps, o, dia, okay, or the goddess Rhea, okay, the, the Rhea, the, one of the uh, older um, uh, chthonic uh, god, uh, deities of, of ancient Greek, Greece. So uh, notice when there's a capital letter that you don't write these marks on top, but they write it just before the letter instead. You'll see that here in uh, this well-known formula from the, um, from the mat Gnostic Mass and, and other uh, sources. So what is this? This is rough breathing on an ah, so ha. Uh, in ancient Greek, this, Greece, this would have still been pronounced as a g, but probably got weakened uh, early on, uh, earlier than some of the other uh, consonants, so that, could have been a g or a r or a y. So hagios or hagios, uh, holy. And then of course we know iao. Um, here I've taken some lines from the um, from the Gnostic Mass. So we have ho with uh, rough breathing, 
which uh, you don't see in the all caps version um, necessarily of, of this text. So Ho means the, Ho Pater, the father, esteem, Ho, and here, uh, another quirk of their, their accentuation is that when they have a diphthong, this ui, um, they always wrote the, the breathings and the accents on the second part. So it, it looks uh, deceptive. This is hui, krios, ho huyos. Okay. So that's the son. The father is the son. Diato pneuma hayam. So ho pater estim ho huyos diato pneuma hayam. Okay. Would be a, um, a, 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 Latish uh, ancient uh, Greek pronunciation of that, or ho pateres tin ho hugos diato pneuma hagion with uh, the gamma actually pronounced. Now I've got a real puzzle for you. This isn't something you've seen in any of your uh, any texts. Uh, so what uh, what vowel is this? What vowel does this um, uh, ada stand for? A, but we've got rough breathing, so it's Hey, that's a form of the before a feminine noun. What is this? This is a smooth breathing ah, so it's not ha, it's just ah. That's gamma, ga, pi with eta gives us pe, agape. So uh, the Greeks like their definite articles, just like the French and the Germans. The love, instead of just love, Esteem is, they like to put their verbs at the end of the, of the sentence a lot of times. Honomos, the law. Okay, so this would be a, a, a way of saying the uh, love is the law in ancient Greek, I think. I'm not an expert on Greek per se, uh, Greek usage, so I might be a little wrong about this, but he agape honomos esteem would be a way of saying uh, <clears throat> love, the love is the law. Um, and then here we've got he agape again, love, <clears throat> and we we saw this uh, up here, hupo, right under. He agape hupo to the telemati. So uh, it, the word thelema takes up a slightly different form after the preposition of uh, hypo, but that's a matter for the grammar. Okay, so he agape hupo to helemati, telemati would be an approximation of how they would have pronounced that expression had it existed in those days. <clears throat> um, oh, we've got a, a question. Can you focus on the last two words again? Um, I just saw this now, so was that- Brian, I meant the last two words from uh, O Pater Est in Hoi Dios, the, at the end there, that, that phrase again. Cool, yeah, sure. Just because um, you said them really fast, I didn't guess. Yes, yes. And, and as I got going, I think I got faster there. So I'll, I'll go through each chunk in, in smaller bits. Ho pater estim ho huyos dia to pneuma hagion. So again, they actually pronounce that cluster, pne, okay? Dia to pneuma hagion. So uh, through, the, through the Holy Spirit. So, ho pater estim ho huyos, the father is the son, diato pneuma hagion, through the spirit holy. Uh, pneuma, you know, we associate it with pneumatic and pneumonia and stuff with breathing and so forth. <clears throat> Good. Um, all right. Uh, so, back to that chart format. Here I've re, uh, arranged those vowels that I had compared with the vowels of Latin uh, in that uh, chart format with the E, different forms, ways of spelling E in ancient Greece, different uh, <clears throat> vowels and diphthongs that came to be pronounced like U or maybe U or U or something like that. The, 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 the information we have on how OI was, uh, Omicron I, Iota was pronounced um, is, is not as conclusive as some of the other evidence we have from, from commentary on pronunciation. So it was either probably started out as OE, I'm sorry, OE, OI, and that then the O became fronted to OI, 
sort of like the French word for, for I, uh, and then that uh, became raised to uh, like in uh, French huit or oui, huit clos, um, and then just simplified to uh, um, eventually. And the different spellings for the long and short a and a, eh, long and short a oh and o, oh, and uh, the various varieties of a. Ah. And then alpha iota would have been a e i uh, in older Greek. Uh, eventually that turned into just an a, eh, an a eh sound, but we're going to stick to this one for now. And then O and ow, okay, E U O A U in, in transliteration would be E U E U A U ow. So now um, I've got the, uh, so, so now I've sort of tried to get you thinking about these sounds in a different framework than the usual one, which is the alphabetical list. Here's the alphabetical list of the letters of Greek with their, um, upper and lowercase forms, uh, their names in Greek, mm -hmm. and their usual transliteration into Roman, and then uh, some uh, handy pronunciation key words with the uh, corresponding uh, letters for the corresponding sounds underlined. Um, and then in the leftmost column, I've got their numerical value, which is what uh, matters for gematria. Um, so uh, you see that we, um, and I think most of, most of you here are familiar with the principles of Gematria, so I won't focus on that so much as the um, correspondences to Hebrew in upcoming slides. Um, so basically, um, um, uh, so diga uh, the, 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 the letter that we know as the letter F, um, was called digamma because it looked like two gammas on top of each other um, uh, and uh, is really only re retained for numerical purposes, just as a letter corresponding to the Hebrew kof uh, was retained for the uh, num numerical value of 90. Um, so any questions about this diagram? This is kind of a useful, I think, uh, reference diagram. If you don't know where to find it in the chart, you can orient, your, but you know their order, you can, can find them this way. And uh, these reminders of their pronunciations. Uh, so um, next up, uh, just uh, focus on the uh, obsolete letters that I just mentioned, digamma from Hebrew Vav, kopa, kopa from Hebrew kof or Phoenician kof, um, they also uh, didn't use the Hebrew letter tzadi, but they didn't keep that for numerical purposes. So from that point on in the alphabet, Greek gematria disagrees with Hebrew gematria by one, one increment. Um, the other thing that's, uh, that's mentioned here, I guess, uh, I, um, or that's not mentioned here is that that eta used to be an a uh -huh sound and um, u, upsilon, uh, used to be an oo sound. And that seems to be reflected in the conventional philemic pronunciation of this formula in the mass. And um, I forget the, uh, Howard can tell us, uh, um, Howard and a uh, Amy can tell us the, uh, the source um, uh, in Crowley's writings that that comes from. But um, this is conventionally in in interpreted as a huh, as a rough breathing, not as the vowel a. And this is conventionally interpreted as u, not as u. So instead of eriliu, this is interpreted as priliu. But again, you guys can play with that. Is, this, is that what he meant? Does, did, did Crowley mean priliu or hriliu or eriliu? That breathiness seems to capture that, that moment of that, that frisson of the climax of the mass. Um, that, um, uh, very nicely. All right, um, next up is a slide showing the correspondences between the Greek alphabet and the Hebrew alphabet. Um, so that puts the, uh, the weirdness of digamma here in, 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 um, in perspective. And then the point at which the Greek uh, gematriatic values start to differ from the Hebrew ones. So that tzadi is, is 90 in the Hebrew alphabet, um, but 
the equivalent of pulp is the uh, the uh, nine ninety in the Greek alphabet. So one hundred is rho in Greek uh, gematria, but kof in in Hebrew. And then uh, when you get to the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, tav, its counterpart in the Greek alphabet is tau. Um, the Greeks added on these extra letters at the end of their that that didn't have equivalents or that in this case was a variant of the Vav that they ended up putting at the end of their, their, um, their order. Uh, the equivalent to that in the Hebrew alphabet are the final forms of the, uh, these um, uh, five letters. Uh, kaf, uh, this is Kaf Sofit, the, the final way, the way that you write Kaf at the end of a word, Mem Sofit, Nun Sofit, Pe Sofit, and Tzadi Sofit. So those can be assigned, they don't have to be done that way, but they can be assigned the values 500 through 900 in, in if you want to play with that in Hebrew Gematria. Um, so, and, um, and as far as the key here, um, I've just given the various pronunciations that we associate with, with these Hebrew letters. Um, and um, these BHs, GHs, DHs, I haven't written them with, with that little superscript because those aren't aspiration, those are spirantization. Those are where a b just turned into a v or a v. It got weakened to a, a sound in which the air continued through the pronunciation. G became a v, v. D became a v. And of course, this happened to those same sounds, b, v, b, g, d, in, in uh, the evolution from um, ancient Greek to modern Greek, too. So if uh, we get, uh, if in the future lecture, we can talk about that. Same with k -p -t, the voiceless stops. They became k -p -t in, um, in Hebrew at some point. And uh, Hebrew uh, didn't write the letter of uh, the vowels. They uh, had these vowel uh, letters for symbols that were a little vowel-like, like this one, which is a, a, a um, is, which is a, a uh, a glottal stop, okay, and uh, this, which is used to suggest different vowel, vowels in Hebrew spelling, v or w associated with vowels like u and o, y associated with vowels like e and a, and so forth. And so that those were uh, ad adapted to represent actual vowel sounds in 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 the Greek uh, adaptation of the West Semitic alphabet. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Aaron points out nicely that, that um, this b -v alternation um, happens in other languages like Spanish, where b and l fell together as the same sound, and it depends on what position you're in in the word, whether you pronounce a b or a v as a b or as that l like sound. Um, and then you have back and forth with like modern uh, Hindi often turning v of Sanskrit into a b. Okay, um, next up, I have a slide on the uh, ancient Greek accent just to kind of round things out. And that will be sort of the end of my kind of exposition of, um, of the facts about Greek. And then we can, uh, um, uh, we have some options as to where we go from there. Um, so the weirdness of accent in Greek is that um, it involved largely just raising the pitch of the voice, not uh, what we call stress, which involves um, louder, longer, you know, the vowels could be long or short and accented or unaccented, and those varied independently of, an, of one another. Whereas in English, when we stress a syllable, we both make it high pitch, uh, usually, um, or low, low pitch, you know, give it some sort of noticeable pitch change, uh, but we also lengthen them. At the same time, we pronounce it more forcefully. So this, um, in ancient Greece, this, uh, um, they had a pitch accent instead. Um, and uh, because of the long vowels and the pitch uh, oriented nature of the accent, you can have the beginning or the end of a long syllable being um, uh, bearing the high pitch. And so you actually had two types of accent, two types of pitch accent. Uh, one was called acute. And so that was the type of accent you would, the only type of accent you could get on a, a short vowel. So ah. Uh, a, E, O, U with this um, accent mark pointing as we write from left to right, pointing to the right, okay, pointing up to the right. 
that's acute accent, indicating high pitch. Um, on uh, a long vowel, that would be the that would be a rise on the second part of the syllable. Ah, I, owl, okay, um, or of a diphthong. I, owl, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> You can tell if it's a long or short vowel, if it's at, uh, epsilon versus eta or omicron versus omega. Um, not so easily unless somebody has annotated it for you with upsilon or iota. I, I had trouble finding these, uh, uh, finding these current versions of it because in fact, they are not, there aren't uh, handy um, Unicode characters for these, uh, for a long and accented upsilon, iota, and alpha. Um, the circumflex accent was where the uh, first part of the long vowel or diphthong got the high pitch and then it fell, the pitch fell during the syllable. So um, this is written either uh, as a tilde here or in some fonts you'll see it written um, just as a semicircle above. And then what we know is the modern circumflex in like French is a pointy version of that, which is basically made up of the acute accent sign and the grave accent sign, one, an, uh, uh, one after another. See here we have the, the um, downward pointing or leftward pointing, backward pointing accent for the grave accent, which initially at least was used to mark any vowel that was not stressed or that was, that was low pitch. Um, and was used only sporadically in old, old, uh, in ancient text, uh, older, older texts. Um, these annotation traditions that are so helpful to us now, just like the vowel points for Hebrew, um, actually weren't used in their day. They were used centuries later by people who were trying to recapture the ancient pronunciation and and didn't naturally speak that way anymore. And so they, they were meant as helpful hints for, for scholars or people um, uh, memorizing uh, texts and so forth, um, and students uh, memorizing um, their, their texts. So anyway, here we have a uh, circumflex. Ah, I, ow, e, o, a, u, 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 o, okay. As opposed to o, u, 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 A, L, E, O, I, okay, and A. Ah. So um, you don't have to know uh, when, where, uh, you, you're not, um, it's not helpful or <laughs> it's not easy to figure out where the accent should go. But when you see an accent marked, um, you can interpret this as a, a simply a high pitch on a short vowel or as a rising tone on a long vowel at, or a diphthong, and this as a falling tone on a diphthong or a long vowel. And then this, this grave accent, we, people still don't quite know what to, um, how to interpret this. Um, oops, I, I used the wrong accent mark there. Um, the, um, so there's different, there's conflicting stories, but basically it's either, um, a way of marking that the accent would, uh, the word would normally be accented if it weren't for where it occurs in the sentence, um, or that it was actually a, 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 a pitch rise, but not as high as the main pitch of the next word. So if a word ends in an acute accented syllable uh, and is followed by another word that has an accent, uh, that acute accent will turn into a broad accent but not circumflex, just the, the graph. So it's sort of like when you have a high right up at the end of the word and then you're up against the next word, somehow that's awkward. And so you, you sort of demote the, the, uh, the, the accent to this graph status. Uh, so uh, with that, um, um, all I have, what I have left, um, I'm gonna switch out of um, slideshow mode and I forget if I'm sharing your sharing my screen or the whole window with you. Can you still see that? Yeah, okay. So I'm just gonna to go to um, slide, slide sorter view so you can see what, what the options are and um, 
Uh, basically, I have my slides from before walking you through the Star Ruby with uh, sound files attached. Um, uh, and then I've got the beginning of slides for the Greek from the Gnostic Mass, which I was sort of cherry picking uh, for examples in the slides um, above. Um, I've got the beginnings of uh, Greek, the, the Greek saint names for the Gnostic Mass. Um, uh, a slide on the Greek Roman uh, correspondences, and I thought, why not throw in the Cyrillic alphabet too, which also was an adaptation of the Greek alphabet. Um, coming attractions would be uh, if you're interested in in the correspondences between Hebrew and Arabic uh, gematria. They 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 do do that same numerology very often. Um, I've had Muslim students on exams writing a particular number, which is apparently uh, you know a gematria for some some uh, you know blessing formula to do well on the exam. Um, but the interesting thing is the modern order of the of letters in the Arabic alphabet is very different from the order of letters in the Hebrew alphabet, but their numerical values follow the Hebrew order. You know, it's, it's very sim simple, similar. And then here is a, uh, another uh, excerpt from the Greek ma magical papyri that, that I thought I might play with. And as usual, I always uh, run out of time to um, post some references, but I can definitely post those in a, um, um, a link. Let me, I have a link to the um, Google Doc, which um, I think I have set to be shareable. Hold on. And I'll put this in the chat window. Yeah. Whoops. Send to everyone. And I think you'll be able to, I'll, I'll set it so that you can uh, view it and download it, but not edit it, I figure. <laughs> but I, uh, I think there may be the capacity, whoops, to, um, I'm, are you seeing my uh, flipping screens? I, I think I, I, I will um, edit it so that, uh, make, make sure you can like post comments. Um, see if there, there's a way for you to post comments. But you can also just email me at um, uh, bgd.kprt at gmail.com. And uh, the reason for that uh, magical motto um, will be the theme of a, of a future workshop on, on Hebrew pronunciation. Uh, thanks a lot, Brian. You're I uh, saved that link as a, a bookmark for a future reference. And this is great because I'm, I'm so glad you added all these other slides yeah. from uh, the Star Ruby and the, uh, all the other things. Um, yeah. I know I'd be interested in a Hebrew Arabic lesson at some point. Good, good. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, other, uh, other, for uh, anybody out uh, there, I would, I would you know, uh, encourage anyone right now who wants to dive into one of these pages be it um, somebody working on the mass who wants to uh, go, you know, focus on that just for a few minutes now, or somebody who wants to uh, ask questions about Star Ruby pronunciation. This is uh, a good time for a little Q and A. Or requests. Can I ask? Um, let's just go over here with this Gnostic mass. The first line: Toto estito soma muy. The M-O-Y always throws me off. I'm never quite sure what to do with those vowels. Right, so the Y, remember, yeah. So the problem is that the, that was the historical U. And so combined with O and U, it stayed U. O became U. So it's when it was by itself, it moved forward to U. And then the Romans didn't have an U, so they pronounced their, the Greek Y as an E. And that's why we get we we treat I and Y as interchangeable. So it's soma mu. Mu. Like a cow. Mu like a cow. You got it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is tu to esti to soma mu. Uh, and I'm giving it some of the accents that you don't see here, but I'll be I'll be working on adding that. 
and that's the nice thing is is a as a Google Doc, um, I'll make sure it's convertible to a, a, a an edit uh, an ongoing editing uh, project so that you can see the updates as I post them. I find with practice, um, and it's definitely easier. This is a good note for the Hakate team. You know, when it's all in capital Greek, man, it makes it a lot easier to to just get down the basics of it. Okay. And with enough with enough practice, you will recognize that okay, pi is a p, and rho looks like a p, but it's an r. And like me now, I need to realize when I see that omicron followed by an, an epsilon, it's mu. Right, right. So yeah. mu, and it's just, just straight mu. Yeah, so with a little bit of practice, this this becomes something definitely that uh, is doable. Yeah, you've got more friends uh, uh, across the two alphabets, uh, more non-false friends among the capital capital letters than the lowercase letters, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, the uh, if, uh, does anybody want to hear the the funny story about uh, P and R in in Cyrillic and 